Hello everybody and welcome to the Athlete Tribe. On this episode we sat down with Greg Bateman, currently playing for Leicester Tigers in the front row. We talked about all things to do with his training, recovery and mental preparation. We really hope that you enjoy this episode. We'd be grateful if you liked and subscribed. Please follow us on Instagram at The Athlete Tribe or check out our website at www.theathletetribe.com. Hi, Greg, and thanks for taking the time to speak to us today. Let's jump right in. Our first question is basically, how has the different clubs that you've played at affected your physical development? Well, firstly, you you were certainly the best, Lee. Um, but I think the the various clubs always have different focuses. So at Exeter, the focus while I was there was on, so say from a cardio point of view, their focus was always on like a central cardio hit. Um, so or not hit, but they were doing lots of hypoxic swimming in pre-season or things to increase your lung and heart capacity. Whereas at Leicester, it's always been about the peripheral strength. So getting your capillary build up in, in your legs. So your legs are more tolerant to the running loads, etc. So Personally, I feel like um, it's a mixture of the two is probably the most helpful, um, particularly, you know, as you'll be able to comment on this far more than I will, but, you know, rugby is a game that involves all of your energy systems, isn't it? So you need to be able to kind of do both. So we've gone to more of a focus now, like our preseason this year, we had more minute on 20 offs for the first few weeks to, to, to have that kind of central hit to the system and then we we sort of tapered that off into the sort of higher interval shorter short time stuff uh, and higher intensity I guess as well um, but I think here they 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 parallel um, they polarize our conditioning so you either do you know, your minute ons, your 90 ons with the short, short rests, or it's eight, 12 second high intensities with your three minute rests. We don't see a lot of those hybrid sessions where you might do a little bit of both and, and whatever. And I think the general consensus is that you, you don't hit those systems as effectively if you try and do both. So Greg, that's great to hear about how your conditioning changes depending on the team you're at or the part of the season you're in. But how do you feel your physical development has changed during your professional career? Mine has developed and adapted. That's the, the large reason for that will be I'm dictated by the programming at the club and there's strengths and weaknesses to that. I'm quite lucky with the, the trainer I have. He has an understanding of the things I like to do and the things I don't like to do that are either good or bad for my body. I think I, uh, particularly in my earlier career, I had a big focus on Olympic lifting and was very keen on that and found that a real good transfer into my game. Um, I don't think there's never been a big focus on it at Leicester. So it's something that I've had to push to have in my programs uh, for, for myself. I think their argument is that not enough lads were technically good enough. So they couldn't ever get what they needed to out of it, if you know what I mean. Um, but for those of us who, who have um, been trained in that, Olympic lifting and stuff is obviously massively beneficial to rugby. So I'd say that's been a, a, a big change. But I think uh, the other two major changes is one, how the game's changed, and two, 
how as I've aged my body's changed so um as uh, as you know my upper body mobility has always been poor lower body mobility very good but as I've picked up injuries or had shoulder operations or whatever that's that's changed what I've been able to do or taken three months out of my training so I've had to change things up as I've gone forward like I, I can't bench press anymore because there's too much posterior loading on my on my labrums so I, I dumbbell press for example um yeah so I think the effect of the professional career in rugby and what that has on your body naturally changes your program in a different way also I think the game's changed quite a lot I think it's obviously gone towards a more kind of set piece collision focused game now to when you and I worked in the premiership together you know what eight years ago it was a bit more open and uh, movement based so now being bigger and stronger is more valuable than being as mobile if that makes sense so I think there's probably been a, more of a shift towards that style of training anyway. So great, great to hear that you found Olympic lifting highly beneficial and definitely something that if you have got good technique, you can get the benefits of that. And they hugely transfer across to strength and power team sports. Now, if we just dive a little bit deeper, can you talk us through what your normal training week kind of looks like? Sure. Well, we've, it's interesting because we've actually just changed our week. Uh, we used to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off, Thursday, Friday team run, play on Saturday, rest Sunday, obviously. We've now changed to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday off, Friday team run, play Saturday. Um, a lot of the reasoning behind that is to try and front load the week so you're fresher for the weekend. Uh, which I personally prefer. I feel like you, on the, the, the previous weeks, you had too much going into the, the game sometimes, particularly because that Thursday session is almost like your last team-on-team -team session. You know, it's still fairly intense, but you're only 48 hours out from a game, you know? Yeah. Um, but in terms of how that week's structured now, Monday will be reviews... Uh, meetings, big leg session on a Monday. Afternoon is often just a walk through, so we'll we'll sort of have a walk and a light jog of what our plays are for the weekend. So that's like a install day. Tuesday we'll have a unit session in the morning, maybe with weights, maybe not, depending on the times, with your sort of unit presentations and meetings and stuff. And then the afternoon is that walkthrough session that you did yesterday, but more intense. So your first three phases at decent speed, but you're not having as much pressure from the opposition or whatever. So you're just kind of getting the reps in. And then Wednesday moves through into like a competitive day. So you, you, we might do like some power or something before we go out, but it's just one rugby session where you run those plays past three, the first three phases with live uh, opposition against you. So you've had the sort of three days to build into it. Whereas on the previous week uh, of Monday, Tuesday, you know, you might walk through something on a Monday, but then you're doing it flat stick on a Tuesday and you've not really had the chance to install it, if that makes sense. And then you have a day off and, you know, you can't really help it, but mentally you might not be in the same space on that Thursday and you don't remember it quite as well or whatever, and then you're almost having to learn it all again, but at maximum speed and intensity on the Thursday, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. Um, and interesting from a strength and condition point, we played around with loads of different uh, structures in terms of two days on, one day off. You know, as like by the sounds of it, you've gone to a, a three day on, one day off. Um, I know uh, some other teams look at kind of one off, three on, one off. Um, and 
I guess it's down to the culture and also, you know, the structure of how the strength and conditioning coaches and the technical coaches see it. But moving on, in that week, what does your kind of recovery look like? We have facilities there. So we have two purpose-built ice baths, hot tubs and stuff to do contrasts. But it's, it's not lead. Um, you can get as much massages almost as you want. Uh, I personally find massages is beneficial for me, but I think that it's probably position specific because um, it's obviously collision based position that I'm in. So I often find massages the most helpful for me. Um, but my lead recovery, as in what I like to do, I have a sauna at home, so I, I use my infrared sauna for for recovery, and I don't I don't contrast at home. I prefer heat to to cold, but during a training week, I'll I'll use the ice baths and stuff if they're there. But it's certainly not a lead thing. I think having having the the dogs at home is particularly helpful because you know we, like you used to say to us about having active recovery on our days off when we, we were at welsh together getting out for a good hour's dog walk is just it's just well, obviously it's really good for the soul and the mind but for your body to just go and have a good walk and a flush for an hour i think is has been really helpful so yeah um that's that's really how i kind of direct my recovery to be honest so in terms of those recovery protocols you just mentioned how do they look over the course of the week normally i would say it's on a monday and tuesday evening and then i might have one on say a, a wednesday or a thursday um probably only three a week um but i have them in the evenings when i'm at home i find it's really helpful for my sleep as well so i'll get because it's so cold outside at the moment as well i'll, I'll give it a good warm-up before i'm in there and sit in there for a good 40 minutes, even with my iPad or, or a book or something, and just, just chill out. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's not like a, it's not linked to a session thing. It's more as and when I feel I need it, but I, I definitely try and get in it at least two, three times a week. Just one question from that. We know that sleep is hugely important for all populations but especially for the athletic population. Is there anything particular that you do from a sleep routine, etc., that you could let us know? Yeah, so um, I did use CBD for, for a fairly long period of time, but I, that was really out the back of a poor patch of mental health over for, for a couple of years where, where I really, really struggled with my sleep and had a, a poor knock on effect into my training diet and lifestyle as a result of poor sleep. Um, I find probably the best thing for my sleep is, is having a solid plan for my week and, and planning exactly what I'm doing and where. So I don't get to bed and think I need to be, doing something for uni work or doing something for the business or whatever. If I get all my mental ducks in a row, that helps me get to bedtime tired enough and sleep. You know, we, we train enough, we burn enough physical energy. It's often mental energy. I think that, that stops me from sleeping, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it's for me, it's more about controlling those, those sort of mental ducks uh, and lining them up for good sleep. I think, I haven't actually worked out yet whether napping or not helps me, which I know sounds a bit weird, but sometimes when I nap, I'll have a great sleep because I'm, I, I need that little 20, 40 minute cat nap when I get home from training. Um, and oftentimes when I don't nap, I'm almost overtired when I'm going to bed and can't get off or whatever. So I think having those little power naps, particularly after the big days, your Tuesdays, your Wednesdays, are really good because it just takes that the edge off that real sort of fatigue that you've got at that period of time. And also then I can be active and mentally alert enough in the afternoon to, to sort of wind my mind back down. Um, but I think 
if I nap too late or nap on days where I haven't done enough to earn it, it can often be robbing Peter to pay Paul in the evening, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I, I think that that's something that I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm still learning whether that, that helps me or not. But with what I've just said there, I think, you know, on that Wednesday session, for example, we're home by half past 12, one o'clock, you can have 45 minute nap and that's not going to take anything out from when you go, I'll go to bed at 10 o'clock. Thanks, there, Greg. That's really interesting to hear about, you know, napping and the benefits of those short sleep intervals to release a little bit of the sleep pressure. Now, kind of moving on, my next question was to focus around the mental preparation that you go through as a rugby player. You've been quite uh, vocal in terms of the challenges that you've gone through. Um, and for me, it's just for you to kind of put across to us what it's like from uh, the mental pressures of being a professional rugby player. So, I mean, my mental challenges are probably unrelated to rugby, but I think um, the, the, the issue with being a professional sportsman is often the, the biggest benefit as well is that our social identities are tied to, to what we do. So I'm Greg Bateman. I'm a rugby player, but actually... I'm Greg Bateman and I play rugby are two different things. And if, and I know we have differing opinions on this, you as in you and I, um, but if rugby is the only thing that I've got when times get tough, so that might be a long injury or particularly for Leicester Tigers, the last five seasons have been poor. If rugby is the only thing I've got, then my self-worth and identity is tied along to that the result of my rugby team, if you know what I mean. So personally, I've found having other, other hats to put on has been really helpful for me. So having been to business interests, having hobbies, having a uni course and all this stuff has been really helpful so that when rugby's not been going well, I can I can get home, take that hat off, and I'll put my uni hat on and plow myself into some uni work so that when I go back to training the next day, I'm going in there with a fresh set of eyes rather than sat at home stewing on how bad it's been for the last few days, if you know what I mean. So I personally feel like it's, it's almost an identity-related thing. Um, but I think that's, that's also then forgetting the fact that the very nature of being a a professional sports person comes with incredibly high pressure anyway. So then you have a naturally high pressure job without thinking about results and all the rest of it. And then maybe add in some life stress as kind of a recipe for disaster if you're not prepared for it. So my advice, which again, I know is potentially different to yours um, for our young lads is to have other legs to your table rather than just having the one leg of being a rugby player. You do your ACL and you're out for nine months and you sat there with a complex. That's a fairly depressing place to be for anyone, isn't it? So I think if you can have other interests, you know, that you can control so they're not taking away from your rugby, go and learn a language, go and learn an instrument, whatever it is, for the, you know, particularly for those sort of blocks where you might be injured for a prolonged period of time actually can be a really good opportunity. So you've obviously mentioned lots of things there from your physical development, your, your rugby development, and also your mental development. It'd just be interesting to know what your kind of next goal, your So that's really interesting to hear from all the different aspects from your physical development, your mental development, your your playing. Uh, what does your goal setting look like, for example, over the next six, 12 months? I take goal setting very seriously um, because I think if you just get into a day-to-day, week-to-week 
cycle of, right, this is just what I need to get through to this week to play this game and move on, you can almost lose focus of what you're doing it for and what the purpose behind why you're trying to do it. So it's taken a fair degree of time for me to get to this place with our sports psychologists, but working out almost reverse engineering. So what do I want to get out of rugby as a, as a real big, big, big picture goal and not tying any sort of specific things to that. But the things that I personally want to get out of rugby are to set myself up from a networking and career opportunities to connect deeply with people past playing rugby and to enjoy it as, and to find enjoyment as well. So then reverse engineering all those things back this next block to me looks like making sure I meet up with the boys for a, for a few meals or um, networking and business opportunities looks like what I'm doing with the beer, what I'm doing with the cafe, what am I doing with my uni stuff to, to keep that train moving forward, if that makes sense. So goal setting, and, and that's almost like an entirely separate um, podcast on its own, but it's something that has genuinely, and I'm not overstating this, changed my life. Yeah, from a, a coach's point of view, we can 100% agree with what you're saying there, that making sure that you set goals um, in terms of you know daily, weekly, monthly, etc., to to build out further becomes hugely important because it means that we focus on the process. Whereas some of us get too caught up with the outcome. And if we just focus on the process, then eventually, if that process and those short-term goals are correct, will eventually lead to our outcome goals. And our last question really is to look at the mental preparation it takes in terms of being a professional rub player at the level that you're playing at. So I think training and matches are very different. So training, I always mentally think about it as getting through, getting through technical reps. So I'm technically trying to get my feet, my shoulders and whatever into the specific position. And I'm not thinking about, you know, being violent or being physical or, or whatever. Um, well, you, you are, but you, you you know it's a technical rehearsal of of a skill. A tackle is still a skill, and I think that's that's not often um, not often thought about. It's kind of thought that tackling and defence is like a mentality, but it's still executing a skill under extreme pressure. You know, um, whereas I think on a match day, it's about reminding myself why I'm why I'm doing it, why I play rugby you know part of rugby is is this physical side of the game which i enjoy and then it's about getting into that mental sort of aggressive state where you you want to hit someone as hard as you possibly can rather than going for a technical rep if you know what i mean but having done enough technical reps in the week gives you the confidence in the skill to execute without thinking i need to get my feet here, my hands here, my shoulders here, or whatever. So, like, I'm, I'll I'll have mental cues. So, if it's a tackle or whatever, it might just be hitting, and that's it. Will just sort of spike that. You want to uh, enforce that collision and initiate it as opposed to be reactive. So, I think it's you can't have one without the other. You can't just get. You can't just rely on, or I can't just rely on getting to a game. I'm thinking I'm going to get in the space to hit people as hard as I can. What I've learned over my years of, of training is trying to rip into those contact sessions during the week to give myself confidence for the weekend. You know, that, that's, that's super helpful for you know, people is that it is a skill. Um, it doesn't really matter if you're you know, the biggest guy or the strongest guy. It, it's still you know, a technical, a hugely technical skill done at high velocities. Um, so I suppose the, the kind of the replication is for a boxer in terms of sparring versus an actual fight. Is that what you're trying to say? Is that you're trying to do 
by the sounds of it at the moment is that each day you increase the speed at that of your skills so for example monday might not even have some contact but you might do some walk through kind of stuff and then tuesday the skills get faster and then you kind of then recover and then basically come saturday sunday you're trying to do that at 100 percent or even more but because you've embedded that motor pattern of what those skills are if you know what i mean so monday is a walkthrough but we still might walk through some tackle technique or we still might walk through the the start of a collision or something like that so that you are practicing you you tracking of a of your feet and you, where your hips are and all the rest of it so yeah definitely so just to add on to that um from a skills point of view kind of how much video analysis are you doing from a day-to-day -day basis week to week etc um so we we do have a fair focus on video analysis at, at our club um we've got a good team of analysts there i think we all have our individual areas that we like to review more than others and i think it's also really important to review the things that you think you're good at or the things that were good as well rather than constantly thinking about what needs to improve or what you're trying to get better at you need to reinforce the, the positives as well and reinforce what, what was so good about things so you can keep replicating the the skills but i think taking for example because we're talking about tackling is you know, I'll sit down with my defence coach, for example, and if I slipped off a couple of tackles or whatever, we'll look at it and, you know, then we can walk through some stuff or do some extra reps at the end of training and, you know, oh, here's where you could have wrapped that tricep a bit more or I need you to get your foot a bit closer. Or, and often, really, with tackles, normally it's something to do with your system before you make the tackle than it is the actual tackle itself because if you're in the right position you often make the right kind of tackle in the right technical capacity. Whereas if you're out of position or react slowly or whatever, it's difficult to make a dominant collision. So um, it's often to do with the bit before it. So yeah, I mean, you, you kind of have to take it with a pinch of salt in some regards because you know often the poor tackles are because you've not worked hard enough or reacted well enough before that. So that's it for this episode with Greg Bateman. We'd really like to thank Greg for taking his time out of his day to answer our questions. We hope that you found it interesting and can take some points away from his comments. We'd love to hear from you, so please drop us a comment below and also like and subscribe to the page.